this is our perspective of how we have tried to um, re, um, improve culturally responsive practice and science in our school. Before looking at that in relation to science though, we think it's really important to acknowledge um, the importance of building a foundation, uh, building a foundation for culturally responsive practice. And our understanding of that is, is that it's one in which educators create learning contexts that raise the level of student engagement. Creating these contexts depends on good building good relationships and enabling shared learning. So across our school, we've tried to um, create culturally responsive pathways for all our learning, not, not just science. And so for us, this has meant we've made conscious decisions to ensure our actions and professional learning val values inclusivity, uses pedagogy based on research and encourages our community to have a voice. So that's taken heaps of time and commitment, like it's been years, um, but it has included such things as developing a vision and values as a school that encourages cultural responsiveness um, with our whole staff and packing documents such as tātaiako and then revisiting that um, throughout the years to ensure we're implementing some of the suggestions and strategies in there. Um, we hold hui every term for different groups. So we have um, a parents group, a Māori um, hui, Indian meetings and Pacifica meetings, which are the main um, groups within our school. Um, our Māori hui, for example, illustrated that within our community, we had a demand for a bilingual class. So after three years of consultation and research, um, we opened our first class with Toi Toi Manawa. In Toi Toi Manawa, I think putty has been doing some work with Tātoi and Toi Toi Manawa lately. Um, so three years later now, we have um, three classes teaching in this setting. For um, currently, what we're doing as well is we're drawing together our... Um, our current Māori whānau that are in mainstream to ensure their voices are heard as well. So the big, there was a big move for bilingual, but then our, our community that have chosen to stay with a mainstream school, we want to make sure that um, we're meeting um, their aspirations. Um, we also run different parent programs, but we modify them to suit our whānau. So we've taken the Reading Together program, I don't know if you've heard about that, to the marae, um, and then both Reading and Maths Together um, to the Indian Temple. And part of doing this, when we're doing this, is we try to think about the possible barriers our whānaus may, our whānau may face. Um, and how we can support them with things like transport, um, childcare, and kai. Another example is that within our school, we celebrate different cultural activities such as Diwali, Indian dance, kapahaka, Pacifica dance, matariki, hāngi, marae um, visits, Māori language week. Um, but rather than making them one-off events if you like, we ensure that we have explicit teaching to precede those experiences. Um, so we've just had a marae visit um, and we made sure the children were comfortable and have a full understanding um, of, of the process as well as empowering our Māori children here who are really, that's their second home, um, really familiar there. Um, so they, they were able to take the lead and contribute their um, expertise as well. During Māori Language Week, we've organised for our whānau to come in, making kai, weaving, poi, um, kites and different activities. In the past, I've arranged for um, Māori students from the high school to come to classes um, to read, play sport, do waiata, poi and te rākau and haka with the kids. Um, to provide those leaders and mentors. 
Um, we're also really lucky to have many teachers visible in our community through their connections with Marae, the Indian community, and also just through the opportunities that um, exist in a small community. Uh, teachers take an interest showing up to students' hobby groups like um, Lego groups and sports games and um, <laughs> rock hunting's a biggie at the moment. Um, we also have a, a huge event where teacher, a gala, where the teachers work with Fano to provide a fireworks gala for the community. Um, another thing, we've always had a really low turnout for our Meet the Teacher evening, so we changed it to a fun night with the pool open, bouncy castles, ball games, interactive class activities and a barbecue, and we had a much higher turnout than um, what we were getting from the traditional Meet the Teacher evenings. Um, finally, we start each year with an identity focus. We are different with different learning experiences where the children identify their ancestors, iwi, ethnicity and family and discuss in depth what makes them who they are. Um, we see it as a way to build homeschool relationships with a joint project where some things come from home, some from school, and um, it's culminated in any a presentation in any form they wish. Um, our, our children shared with their peers um, before we had an open earn evening to share, um, uh, we called it This Is Us, um, in term one and Fano came, they visited across the classes with classmates and friends, so it was really successful. Um, the importance of this, these kind of efforts is that they set the climate for us to ensure that that makes ensuring we have a culturally responsive science program a, a lot easier. Um, so nothing's in isolation and we look at things holistically, but then identify specific areas to target. Um, so in terms of teaching and learning in science, Darwin and I have used um, a key reading from Cowie and others and we try to consider the three major implications which that research identified as key factors for success, um, which I hear it about building and creating opportunities, um, creating an inclusive and respectful classroom, and having diverse ways um, of learning and, and learning and assessment. So the key factor one that um, we're always considering is that show, it showed that um, it identified that teaching and learning and science is enriched when teachers build bridges and create opportunities to connect the classroom curriculum with children and community experiences beyond school. One of the things that we committed to at the start of the year is making sure that we have at least one planned experience a term in science where our extended whānau can be involved. Um, last term we had an open learning evening as well as a field trip, trip to the marine station. So during the term we explicitly taught observation and inference from Capability One um, using the discrepant events from our STLP programme as well as um, other contextual experiences. We found that that repetition with a variety of experiences armed our learners with specific, the specific scientific vocabulary with key questions and gave them the familiarity with um, capability one to ensure that they'd be successful. And then at our open learning evening, they led the learning with the whānau. Um, and you'll probably from the pictures, you notice some of these activities if you've done them yet. So we had the ear cannons, the skittles activities, wet paper, different sand activities, um, and photos of scientists at work. We wanted to make sure it was non-threatening, hands-on and fun. And so our whānau were able to relax and enjoy the evening as they basically just played around with science. They didn't have to have the answers. Um, yet they were able to make connections and bring their own experiences and knowledge. 
it was really great. We had grandparents, aunties, uncles, siblings, cousins, and parents, and they were all really highly engaged, discussing ideas in their home language, um, as well as English, and visiting other classrooms with lots of laughter and learning happening simultaneously. Um, our turnout was significantly higher, with over 80% attendance across all five classrooms, and the feedback from our parents was overwhelmingly positive. Um, then we hit them with the whānau questionnaire. When you get round to doing your um, self-review, it might be something that, that we had to look at how to um, see where our whānau thought we were in order to, to become more responsive to their um, needs and aspirations. So we included this at one of the rotations. Um, we designed it quite carefully, um, thinking about our wording and questions. Um, we were mindful of the poor response of surveys that we've had in the past, with our whānau being uncomfortable completing these and how we could overcome that. So we included it in a rotation at our open evening. Um, we recognised our kids with a click it, which is part of their um, positive behaviour reward system. And we cued our teachers on how to assist whānau um, by talking with them, you know, encouraging their ideas and doing the writing for them if that's what they wanted. And we limited ourselves to five questions. One which asked about their skills and interests and another the ways they could, would like to see us more involved in the community and their interests in the community. Uh, we also shared with parents that um, the upcoming units and asked how they could contribute. And part of that was openly sharing with them our weaknesses um, from different cultural perspectives and recognising some of their cultural strengths that we knew of, because obviously we don't know them all. Um, but from this, for our next unit, which is around earth science, we have a Filipino expert in fossils, an environmentalist who researches the impact of minerals in our rivers from a Māori perspective, a parent who wants to share a specific island experiences, two keen grandparents who are science teachers and want to, um, they actually want to plan a day, we've since found out, which is going to be great. We've got a dad bringing in a um, hand auger um, to show different strata, yeah, um, and another who's willing to build things for experiments, um, two family rock collections, and offers to help in the classroom. One thing we found um, was the importance of the learning context. Um, so we make, try and make sure they're familiar and relevant to raise student engagement. Last term was summer and the bay is beach, beach central. So we focused on sand and shells because all our children have a wide experience, wide variety of experiences here. Um, and, and them, along with their families, were keen on Monday mornings to share their ideas and findings and things from the weekend. So we were able to build on their existing knowledge, um, highlight the different cultural knowledge different groups brought to the table. Um, for example, two Māori boys shared about how they use their toes to gather pipi, another child bought shells to identify, and another boy um, shared how he's not allowed in the water, only on the sand, and, and different things like that. Key factor two in the research identifies that science is enriched when teachers and students create an inclusive and respectful classroom culture that welcomes and responds to outside expertise to contribute to collective sense making in science. So early in week one of two, one in the week, early weeks? Early weeks, yeah. Of two one, uh, we got our learners to draw a picture of a scientist and from the analysis of that, we prioritised the need to um, unpack what a scientist does, what they do, what tools they use and how they work. And then Dalwyn organised 
a day in the life of a marine scientist field trip, making link, links to a science organisation that she already had a relationship with, while providing a context we believe many of our whānau would feel comfortable about. Um, the day had a strong ecological and environmental focus as that was the, one of the key learnings that our marine scientists wanted the children to take away um, with them and we were looking at ways to balance their um, like needs in that with ours. So yeah. Um, so it was full of hands-on activities of the type that marine scientists do the teachers as teachers we went in um, a day earlier and learnt some of the stations so we could take them and then the marine scientists led the other um, stations and then the parents moved around with student groups um, as both learners and holders of knowledge and it was a real it was it was a roaring success um, yeah so, um, yeah, as we shared earlier, in our open learning evening, we asked our parent, how parents felt they could contribute to our next unit of learning, and this term we're reconnecting with them to take them up on their offer. Um, and we think this is vital. Don't ask people what they can do and then leave it. <laughs> you know, like show you value them by um, following up and doing something about it. And it, you know, it takes a lot of time and a lot of effort, but I think it'll be well worth it. Um, an important part of this is that we are letting them take the lead. They're the experts and we're the learners. Um, during the holidays, I touched base with one of our mums in the supermarket who had indicated a passion for the environment. Um, she, just through talking to her, she was um, saying how important it was for us to be in re involved in more recycling. Um, she shared about how she buried things in the garden with her own children to show them the effects of waste. And now she's keen to come in and, and do that in classes. She has the passion and the knowledge that will inspire our kids. And so this is one way we try to build a learning community um, to include our family, students, communities, and teachers. Okay. The third key factor in the Cowie and other research um, identifies that science teaching and learning is enriched when learning and assessment provides diverse ways for children to express, develop and gain feedback on their growing knowledge and expertise. So, right, with regard to learning, Along with good teaching practice, like using wait time, peer sharing, um, no hands discussion, ambitious type science teaching type things, we use um, accelerated learning and literacy principles to try to address the gaps in context of new learning and help, help our students to succeed in class today. Um, on screen are some of the, the principles um, which, you know, they, they apply to all curriculum areas, not just literacy. So one of our key questions when we're planning um, our learning experiences, what do our, what do my kids need to know now or this week to enable them to succeed next week? So we need to activate students' background knowledge as well as building background knowledge. Um, our kids are very diverse in their background knowledge and experiences, and it's more than just race, ethnicity and language. So we look for ways to build background knowledge, including their science vocab, um, by reading books and media, using direct experiences like demonstrations, field trips, guest speakers, watching and discuss, discussing videos, and taking virtual advantage, adva advantage of virtual experiences. Um, our home learning projects are planned to be quite open. We, the children choose what they focus on and how they're going to present their findings. One of these 
um, last term was what is a scientist. The children chose a scientist they were interested in, found out about it, what they did, what tools they used, where they worked, um, and they presented it in their own ways, which was very varied. Um, this allowed them to follow their own ideas and experiences, and it, the support and um, involvement of their family was was amazing. Yeah, and that's the feedback we've had from our Fano is they that's the kind of projects they like when they can yeah and do it's open ended and they can make choices for themselves. Uh, um, and and with their kids. Um, we followed that on with a home learning coordinates three boxes um, where they wrote observations about an item in a homemade box for others to get. So they needed, it was in a way they had to transfer the uh, knowledge of observational writing, of writing observations um, and drawing inferences provide like uh, clues. Hang on a second. Someone's got their microphone on. Um, please turn it off if you are not Ang. Please turn your microphones off, everybody. I don't know how to. You click the um, mute button on the left at the bottom of the screen. Thank you. Okay, back to you, Ange. Nearly finished anyway. Um, we're also trying a model where we're integrating writing with science in a way that maintains the integrity of both curriculum areas, which seems to us to be the hardest thing when you're trying to integrate. Good in theory, but hard in practice. Um, our children don't want to write for writing sakes. They want to write on meaningful, authentic contexts. Um, and we've found that planning um, their writing learning goals as we plan science and integrating that way has been um, really good at motivating them to write and keeping them engaged. Um, so, um, some examples. So we've so when we've done the learning intentions for our sand inquiry and writing, these have included things like writing a list of observations of different types of sand or pictures of sand, writing in sentences using because to show inference, writing questions about their wanderings and what a good question looks like. Um, writing about a memory, personal experience of being in the sand because they all had a prior knowledge and experience um, with that. And so also for both of them, um, when using the success criteria, we set that clearly out and then we scaffold the learning experiences using I do, we do, you do. Um, another thing we use is to, to a kind of tainer, um, which like the I do, we do, you do strategy, supports our children to achieve when learning together, um, when they're paired with and to, as to a kind of tainer learning buddies. Together they share their ideas, support each other, and give ideas to the buddy in discussions. And feedback, feedback, feed forward, feedback, feed forward. Um, yeah, so it, it's, yeah. Um, finally, uh, in terms of diagnostic and summative assessment, um, we are always looking, trying to think of and use different modes of these um, and, and look at ways that they're culturally, it can be culturally inclusive. So whether um, they're speaking as, like whether it's speaking, writing captions for photos, drawing rather than um, writing answers, dramatizing, making models, using media to record their ideas orally, or apps like Book Creator. Um, and what is a scientist? We did drawings before and after of what a scientist was. For our sand, when we were doing sand, we at 
for our summative assessment, we just gave the children a blank piece of paper to draw what they knew about SAN. This was a contextual um, learning outcomes to show their knowledge. They used drawings, diagrams, captions. And then they spoke about them. And then they shared them in groups and then with the class to um, expand on their understanding and ask questions still. And so the learning didn't just stop at that point in time. Basically, our goal there is to try and find ways which are non-threatening so that all our learners can share, uh, can shine. So that's us in summary. We've tried to share with you um, the importance we believe in building a foundation across the school, but then some of the specific things we've done in science um, to build bridges and create opportunities to connect class learning with experiences beyond school, um, to create an inclusive and respectful culture using um, outside expertise as well, and diverse ways for learning and assessment of our children. Thank you. I'm blown away. <laughs> um, we're open for questions. Um, I, Run away in a good way or a bad way? In an, in a, in an excellent, I'm, I'm stunned by what you've actually achieved um, and what you're doing. I've got a couple of questions as a uh, POM who's not got a very good mastery of Maori. I've got three words I'd like you to, um, or, or, two terms, three words that I'd like you to um, tell me a little bit more about. One is tatayako. And the other is your tuakana tena, with which I'm not familiar. So I'd like to kick off the questions so, with that. Tuakana tena. Have we got, are, is, are we on picture or? You're can on, you? I can see you. Yes. Oh, we can't see oh, we can't see Oh, anyone. God. I haven't got my, I haven't got my camera on. Tuakana tena is using, like, it, it translates to older and younger. Um, but in a classroom, you face it, basically the way we use it is someone who might um, be more confident or stronger in that area and one who's not as... Um, but it's kind of more like big brother, little brother, but not in a classroom setting. So it's a sort of like a buddy system? Yes, it's a buddy it system is. where the expertise of one helps the other one. Okay, cool. But not um, not so that you've got the highest person with the lowest person. Mm -hmm. you get what I mean? Yep. You need for them to both be able to contribute cool. for it to be successful. Okay, thank you. Now I'd like other people, anybody else want, got, got questions to ask, please um, unmute your microphones and ask the questions and I'll just mute mine while you carry on. We'll Use about five minutes. Oh, hi. Um, this is Debbie Ayres here. And I'm just uh, wondering what school you're at. I think I missed that. Oh, we didn't say. Fairhaven School in Te Puki. Te Puki. Ah, well, uh, I thought your presentation was absolutely amazing. Oh, thank you. <laughs> Sounds like a fantastic school. We think so. It's a desktop <laughs> school. We're about... Uh, 35% Māori, um, yeah, a high Indian population as well, and our Pacifica numbers are quite low, but yeah. And, and how, school, how big is the school? About 400 to 450 children by the end of the year. Right, wow, okay, thank you, thanks. Uh, socio-economically, we're a decile three, but at one, um, one end you've got very wealthy kiwi fruit and farmers, well, some of the farmers, mm -hmm. and then you've got very poor, some, very, some of our whānau is very poor, which is why we always, for any meeting, try and organise that we can pick people up. We provide trans child care at either the school or the marae or the temple, wherever we're holding our, our hui. And we always provide kai. And we also have a fairly high transient population too. Yeah. With um, seasonal work. 
Hi, it's Gillian here. I'm not sure if you can hear me. I'm, yeah. I'm just curious as to how, how did you start by getting other teacher buy-in? I suppose that's where I talked about, where we talked about building um, a foundation. So rather than, we're lucky at our school, this has probably been a 10 year process, but the last year we've been able to um, specifically target science. So as a 10 year process, we've, we've moved, worked out with our school towards becoming more culturally aware. Um, do you mean cult, um, teacher buy-in for the culturally responsive aspect or teacher buy-in to our science um, program? Oh, sorry. So, sorry, for the culturally responsive, yeah, because, I mean, obviously it's a huge, huge thing and, and I guess possibly challenging for some people. You know, um, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, um, I think probably it also comes through your um, school leadership and management and that and getting people on the walker to actually drive the culturally responsiveness. And it's probably, as Anne said, something that's developed over time and, um, yeah, we've got stronger as, as we've been more um, dedicated to it, probably. And also in the research and what you learn and different strategies and that, it doesn't just work for Māori kids. It, it works for... So we started with focus on biculturalism, but we've... And, and that's still very important to us. But at the same time, teachers now buy into the fact that actually those principles work with all our children. Yeah. Um, but it, for our Māori kids, it's a must, not a maybe, yeah. I suppose, that they, that they feel val valued. And also, have you, you've been on the leadership course, eh? Yes, we have, yeah. Well, you remember the Lone Nut video? Did you see yeah. the Lone Nut video? Mm, not sure if I can remember. Sorry. <laughs> that Lone Nut. I don't know if it is. <laughs> One guy's dancing like a crazy man and he's the Lone Nut and everyone is looking at him like he is, the, you know, an idiot. And then someone else from that, but he's ignoring them and being the Lone Nut. And then someone else comes along and says, that lone nut's having a bit of fun, the first follower, and then after that, and that's kind of what happened in our school, is that um, you might be the person to pick it up and drive it, and in a way that's, like, I've always been part of the Māori team at our school, and we've all, always looked for ways to um, develop culturally responsiveness in a way that is not threatening. Yeah, cool. Thank you. And having lots of fun. But I think when you look at um, works by um, Cowie and others, um, a lot of the, well, the three main things that they were talking about, it, it applies to all children and it's actually mm -hmm. just really good, um, I don't know what you call it, good strategies, good um, principles. A good model to follow, isn't it, for all kids? Yeah. And is. if you, um, if you, like, one of the key things for us was um, unpacking Tataiako and get a copy of it through the ministry because it has specific things that you can do. Thank you. Also for us, I hope, you'll, I hope your leaders, having strong leaders who support it helps a lot. Cool. Thank you, ladies. Okay, I think that we'll leave the questions now for the, um, these two. Thanks so much, you two folk. I really enjoyed that. Um, and let's move over to Pooty. Pooty, are you still there? Are you ready to take over? And no, if you would turn, okay. your, turn your microphone off, that would be great, and your video. And we'll hand over to Pooty. Thanks, over Jay. to you, mate. Thanks, Michael. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Um, I just need to figure out where my screen share is. It's at the bottom in the middle. Ah, uh, there it is. Yeah. Um, before I start, though, I did really want to um, thank the previous presenters. What an amazing presentation. It was so in-depth and well thought out. And I'm just wondering, have I got anything of value to add? <laughs> How am I supposed to follow that? 
But um, thank you very much, ladies. It was fabulous, and I really appreciate everything you shared. Okay, I'll just jump on this one and see if I've got the right one. And here we go. All right. Um, I kind of get the feeling that I'm going to be preaching to the converted, but um, I'm going to follow through with this presentation anyway. And I guess for some people, it can be a bit of a tricky topic. Our classrooms now um, are blessed with learners from many different cultures, but my presentation today specifically revolves around the notion of our bicultural nation as a starting point. So as a teacher and a principal in Māori Medium Education, this is my experience and this is what I'd like to share with you today. Some people may see culturally responsive practice as an opportunity, um, whereas others sometimes view it as an inconvenience. So I guess the question is, what is culturally responsive practice in this context and is it even a thing? Um, <clears throat> Part of our professional practice, I suppose, as teachers, is demonstrating our commitment to the Articles of the Treaty and the Bicultural Partnership in New Zealand. So having a culturally responsive classroom, it benefits all of our learners and it's also a big part of our job. So in relation to the Articles of the I guess there are a few questions that um, maybe we could keep in mind in our practice. And those are things like, um, how do you lead in your classroom in a way which supports your mighty learner? How do you ensure equitable outcomes for Māori? And how do you support your Māori learners to access their culture and identity? Culturally responsive education is a framework that ensures cultural references in all aspects of teaching and learning. And I suppose it's based primarily on the notion of respectful relationships. And as our previous presentation alluded to, it really does benefit all learners and it provides another lens with which we can look through. So ideally, what does a culturally responsive science program look like? It values language, culture and identity and it uses knowledge about the culture and life experience of students to support teaching and learning and it also, unfortunately, promotes academic excellence and has very high expectations. Obviously science is treated by society as facts and it's considered valid and highly valued. And because of this, it's based on evidence, there's um, empirical evidence and sometimes in Mātauranga Māori we find that a little bit different. Mātauranga Māori in science, um, or pūpaiao, is probably not as valued in some, in some circumstances because it can't be, um, it's not considered empirically evidenced. It's often considered to be a cultural add-on or a narrative as opposed to a valid and legitimate knowledge system. So Mātauranga Māori informs our practice in science. But what could Mātauranga Māori and science look like in the future? So it's not just in the living world and planet Earth and beyond um, strands. It's, it's something that we want to look forward to in the future so that our kids get a really good idea of what they can do as scientists with a Māori worldview. As Georgina Stewart um, refers to, having access to two different knowledge systems can become a resource and an asset rather than a problem. And it shows learners that there are other lenses with which to view the world through. And I think that this is a really good thing. So as an example, um, Michael referred earlier to Ikebino Kahikura, which was our health, uh, our science and technology program that we started to implement at our Kura in the far north. Um, at that time, the area that we were looking at was around Karikari Peninsula. Um, today, what I'm going to talk about is the Rangatau history, but it's the same tool and the same principles, it's just used in a different area. When we started doing this study in the far north of Akuda, which would have started maybe five years ago, our intention really was to assess the health of the waterways up there. 
So we looked at the estuaries, we looked at the open sea, we looked at the rock pools and we looked at the lakes. And um, we we're really fortunate that a lot of the uh, Kuyanko Matra of the area were still alive and they could share their stories with us. As a result of some of the studies that we started, I've seen recently in the last three to four months that they've decided to look at developing a marine reserve at Matai Bay, which for us was one of the things that we were really hopeful um, would happen. As a, I'm not saying it was a result of our sites program, but I think that we started to raise awareness amongst the community about the things that were happening up there. So in Tauranga, we have Rangatawa Harbour, Rangatawa Estuary, and um, there are two kura that are close to that estuary that we're hoping to do this project with. Um, so this is my local area, and there are at least eight marae dotted around the harbour. As a child, I grew up here, and gathering food from this estuary for Fano and Hapu and the marae was a normal part of our lives. We knew which areas to collect from, the tides and currents we needed to be mindful of in the specific times. We collected titiko, pithy, oysters, and we set nets for flounder and mullet, and also tuna. At the same time, we learned a lot about the history of our area and the places we were not to go. In relation to this, Ngaitahu have been doing a lot of work around the notion of Kaitaki Tonga. And their work around developing the state of the Takiwa reports included the development of what they call the Cultural Health Index. And this is what you see on the left side of the page um, when it refers to Manaki, Manafinua, Modi, and Matauranga. Briefly, Manaki is the ability to look after visitors in the best way possible. And in our case, that meant offering them kai and delicacies particular to our harbour. Mana whenua is the ability to make decisions about what happens in our area based on traditional knowledge of its use and to ensure sustainability. It also refers to the mana of the whānau, hapu and iwi if they are able to continue their traditional food driven practices. Modi is the life force of the area and it's critical. If it's compromised, then the ability of our iwi to exercise manaki and mana whenua is also detrimentally affected. Matauranga is the reference to our ability to continue to have a close relationship with our area. So that traditional knowledge, ways of being, culture and language are always retained. So when you consider the implications of both types of data, when looking at the effects of development and pollution, it provides a much bigger picture. So on the right are these types of data that we normally associate with monitoring um, the health of the waterways or the estuary. When you look at what's happened to Rangatoa Harbour in Tauranga, industry, rapid growth and in installation of oil pipelines has had a dramatic effect. The build-up of sediment, the runoff from factory, and breaks in the pipeline and oil spills have seen a huge and rapid decline in the health of our harbour. We can no longer offer our visitors our traditional foods. So in this instance, our ability to practice manaki is compromised. The pipeline was put in without our consent and the build-up of sediment has changed the depth and the course of our waterways. So in that instance, our manafinua is also compromised. The health of our harbour is failing. So our modi is critically ill for our harbour. And because we can no longer take our children to these areas to collect food, our traditional knowledge and stories are no longer shared. And this is even before we start looking at the data on the right. So when you consider the two types of lenses, the two types of data, the bigger picture has widened for us. And I guess the point is that I'd like to make is that it's really good to have both types of data to fully show what is happening in our harbour. And that's the value of having more than one lens. So um, this is a video about Ngaitahu's response to exercising the boulders kaitaki. And I'd like to share this with you. Um, it's probably about eight minutes long. Um, so if you don't mind, I'm going to put it on now.
All right, so pretty much um, that's the end that I wanted to end on, just an example of what um, Kaitaki kind of looks like in an area like Kaitahu. Hopefully, um, we'll be sharing that sort of work here in Tauranga and maybe further up north. Uh, but in terms of a culturally responsive science program, I think for us in Māori medium, that's what we're going to be aiming for. Um, just in conclusion, I guess I'd just like to say thanks to all of you that um, took the time out to come and watch, but also to those of you that are in classrooms every day and working to engage so many more of our learners in science. I think it's fabulous and I'd like to thank you all for the hard work that you do. Kia ora. And stop. Thanks, Pudi. Can you stop okay. sharing now? Cheers. With pleasure. Okay. Um, thank you. I can't think of a question off the top of my head, except that I um, really enjoyed that. And I, I, I wasn't quite sure where you're, you were talking about um, when you were talking about the example of the estuary. Is that in, in Tauranga? Yes, it is. It's in Tauranga Harbour. Um, okay. And it, yeah, it's quite so, a big harbour. So you've got a lot to do there with the um, the container ship problem. Um, but... Yes, so the, the container ship is on the ocean side. Uh, the harbour that I'm referring to is on the, is, is sort of um, closer inland, but it does it does flow out to the sea. But yes, we've been affected by the mobile oil pipelines in our harbour that keep. Um, Having leaks. Right. Okay. Jolly good. Uh, I can throw this open to other people to ask any questions of Pooty, and then when we've had a few minutes of uh, asking her, we can throw it open to general discussion. So over to you guys. John here. Um, looking at one of your slides and kind of looking, comparing a, a Maori worldview and a Pākehā science view. Mm -hmm. It seems to me that the, the Maori worldview is a much more holistic um, kind of worldview in terms of um, making that connection, making that relationship to the people in the land. Would that be a, a good thing to, is that kind of how you would see things? That European science kind of focuses on the detail, whereas Maori appear to kind of step back and look at the whole picture. Yes, actually, John, that, yeah, that's, that's a, a great way to describe it. Um, and I think probably the, um, the advantage of, of having the, the two you know, types of lens is that you get a much bigger picture than if you just had one. Um, that makes sense. Kia ora, it's Ange again. Um, thank, you, thank you for your kind words, Putty, but <laughs> you were amazing. Um, and so um, we'll probably contact you after this for some more ideas, but um, um, tackled with some hard issues. Yeah. But um, oh, what was I going to say? So one of the one of the um, one of the questions that was aimed at me, but I thought after watching yours, I thought. Um, as I was thinking to help answer that, but to ask you as well, was um, when, so often what I, this is me personally, is that from our, our Māori culture, we um, say, for example, with navigation or something like that, the, the, there's not the research, that empir empirical mm -hmm. evidence to back it up, although now modern science is starting to catch up with the facts that, okay, when we are looking at it under research, we're proving that they knew what they were talking about. Um, how, yeah. so, but for, for our teachers, something that, um, like within, we're quite lucky within our school, we have a broadish um, knowledge base about Te ao Māori, but then there's things where we know that the Māori perspective, but we don't really have the understanding behind it. So we park it with our classes, which is probably what I'd recommend to the other team. I just say to my kids, I have to park that and go and find someone who knows. Yep. Do you know of really good resources or um, where you... You, do you know people you can tap into within our communities or nationwide 
to you know what I'm asking for like yeah, yeah, yeah. like some places like Rungawa is quite quite often easily accessible but yeah. some some things aren't yeah I do I do know what you're um, asking and it's a great question um, because I often get uh, Māori teachers asking me the same thing <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> um, usually what I would try to do is I would suggest the local you know local knowledge really um, is, is so helpful. So if you have people in your Fano hapu or iwi that you can refer to, then I would definitely ask there first. But if you don't, then um, what I find is that as science teachers, we have we build up networks. And so if there are questions that you really need help with um, that you're not sure about, then just let me know and I'll try and find the answer for you. Because I'm really lucky that I have a lot of um, very knowledgeable friends um, that usually are able to point me in the right direction or give me some some help. So yeah, feel free to email me or get in touch and we'll see what we can do. Cool. Yeah, I'm like, I mean, we're kind of at Fairhaven a bit the same way. We've got a rich, mm. um, a lot of links with our our um, our hapu here and our iwi, and and we're lucky with people at school and and our whānau, but not every school is has that access yes uh, so it's quite difficult because often the stuff online is quite global global and mightn't actually be relevant for your area the stuff that you referred to in your presentation around building bridges and building up the foundation that's that's really valuable and yeah. um, regardless of whether it's science knowledge or Anything, mm. it's a really great place to start is just to start building bridges and making those connections in your local community if you can and sort of I, I kind of think that nothing beats local knowledge and yeah, if you yeah. can you know start to make those connections then do it and if you consider the thing around the notion of respectful relationships I'm, I'm fairly sure um, that you'd, you know, you'd start to make some good ground yeah I hope that was helpful very <laughs> Uh, any questions or comments or discussions about um, either or both presentations? We're open for that now. A few minutes, uh, maybe five minutes, and then we'll draw it to a close because it's 8.41 and it's getting towards my bedtime. <laughs> okay, John here again. Um, I, I find it relatively easy to, to make the, the a kind of connection with the living world. Um, what, what would be your thoughts about making things like physics and chemistry a little more culturally appropriate? That's a really good question. <laughs> and one that um, obviously we do get from teachers all the time even in terms of technology, for instance, around making coding more culturally appropriate. And I guess my response to that would be um, that in terms of mātauranga Māori and what we value as, as, as knowledge in mātauranga Māori really does revolve around our core values, I suppose, and the way we view the world. And that informs how we practice what we do. So I guess... Ultimately, you know, gravity is gravity or a chemical reaction is a chemical reaction, but it's the stuff that happens behind that. For instance, um, I have a son down in Dunedin and he's doing his health science degree. And I know that when he's doing whatever that he needs to do, he takes with him his worldview. And so when we talk about how to make something like physics or chemistry more uh, culturally appropriate. I suppose it's understanding that a Māori worldview or lens might be slightly different and that it's okay. It's okay that they might view, I mean I have a five-year-olds who view gravity as an expression of the love between uh, Papa Tūnaka and Rangimu and so Papa Tūnaka is always trying to pull him back down towards her and I'm fine with that. I, I, don't, I don't need to say that because um, actually you know, the scientific view is this. Um, I think that 
as Māori, we grow up knowing and feeling very much that there are two distinct knowledge systems that we you know that we grow up and live with. And um, you get to a point where you accept that. And as if, if you're a teacher in a classroom and you, I suppose, um, hear children or you see your students talking about things like that, it's, it's, it's a matter of perhaps not saying to them, actually, that's not actually what happens. The science, scientific view is this. Um, it's, a, it's really hard to um, try and, for want of a better word, um, say that a culturally appropriate view for chemistry is a certain thing. Um, because I, I don't think that that's the point. I think the point is that you understand that as a different culture, maybe. Um, we understand the nature of the chemistry, we understand the nature of physics, but we also bring with it other types of knowledge or lenses. I'm not sure if that's helping you, John. <laughs> yeah, um, but using that gravity example, yeah. if, if, if you're kind of thinking about gravity and, and want to play around with that, and, yeah. and, and a student talks about that love, and I, I personally have no problem with that, but, but how do you swing it around to the gravity without denigrating, yeah, without, no, without, without denigrating that world view? Um, I think it's okay to say, here's another way of looking at it, and this is equally as important and valid. Mm. No, I, I, yeah. What I um what I do is that I say um, as a sci when I'm thinking like a scientist, I might think like this. When I'm thinking as a Maori, this is how I think. That's how I say it to my kids. And then some of like often then you'll get other stories from other cultures of how how they perceive things and so I'll say, so I try to put, that's how I personally try to deal with it. Um, I try to say, so yeah, to value both ideas but to say, this is me when I've got my scientist hat on and this is me because this is what I grew up believing kind of thing. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. Can I um, butt in here for a second? I think that there's um, uh, what happened historically. Uh, this is this is me talking, not any authoritative statement. So it's only Michael. But I think that what happened when um, uh, the sort of sciences we know it in the West um, started developing, a lot of the old ways of looking at things, which were more symbolic and more um, uh, it, more parallel to um, other cultures like Maori culture and, 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 and um, uh, First Nations cultures and so on. We had, I think, um, some of those ways of looking at the world were in through the lens of alchemy and similar um, ways. Um, and I think that we lost a lot when we moved over to that rationalist sort of left brain way of looking at the world. And so I think that one of the um, gifts that um, Maori and other cultures have to bring to us in the West is to begin to um, re-establish the balance between the left and the right brain and um, the, the, yeah, the rational and the intuitive way of looking at things. So for what it's worth, that's my take on it. That seems to have made people go quiet. <laughs> oh, I'm going to put Delwyn in it here because she was just sharing about her work with, um, she's glaring at me guys, who work at um, the Marine Field Station and she worked with Kane, a scientist who was um, a Māori, Māori as well, Māori first, scientist second, um, working on the Pippi Enhancement Project. And he was oh, talking yeah. when they went to the, um, to the local people, the iwi, and talked to the kaumata, and, and they got 
all the historical ways that the people had done um, resettling areas of Pippi, and it was actually their ways that they ended up doing because they were by far the um, most sensible and best ways. But he did a lot of work with the local marae and schools, Kura over there, and it was actually a really amazing project. So, yeah, thanks, Ange. <laughs> she doesn't say much, but when she talks, it's deep. <laughs> Okay, are there any more questions? Because I think it's about time we um, called it to a halt. It's almost 10 minutes to nine. Um, oh. I'd like to say on behalf of the SPLP uh, 2017A, thank you very much, you present presenters. Thank you for the, your time and effort and um, greatly appreciate it. Thank you.